What is going on, everybody? Welcome into the soon-to-be very competitive NFC South. We got two more of these divisional breakdowns. Uh, last up, we have the AFC South. Before we hop in, hit that like button down below. When this video gets a thousand likes, we will unlock the final division here. And before we do start, I have one quick thing I need to address because I get dozens of comments each year from people who come into these videos, watch them, and proceed to inform me, this video's stupid, you have no idea how these guys are gonna pan out, why aren't you an NFL GM if you're so smart? First off, well, why are you here? Why'd you watch the video in the first place? Second, no, nobody knows everything, including your team's general manager. Bill O'Brien just traded the best wide receiver in football for a bag of Doritos. The Jags took a punter, the pick before Russell Wilson. The Bears passed on Watson and Mahomes for Mitch Trubisky, so let's not act like the NFL is any better at this. But that's also like going into a Super Bowl preview show and saying it's dumb to analyze the game because we have no idea what's going to happen and who's going to win. Look, every year teams screw up the draft. We look back saying, what the hell were they thinking? And more often than not, we didn't actually need hindsight to tell us that it was a bad draft in the first place. So I'm here as someone who spent countless hours evaluating these players, studying team building philosophies, historical draft data, attending the Senior Bowl, and it's my job to tell you who I personally believe did a good or bad job with the picks that they had. And hey, by the looks of it, I wasn't so bad last year. So let's hop in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, really killing it at the top of this draft. Hard to say there's a team that's had a better offseason simply getting Tom Brady in there to upgrade that quarterback position. They get Gronk to come out of retirement uh, the week before the draft. And then here we go with their draft. Tristan Wirfs starts to fall. They move up a couple spots, uh, just one spot, to get Tristan Wirfs, who is, to me, the third best tackle in this class in a very talented tackle pool. He's one of the better tackle prospects to come out in a long time. He is going to start right there at right tackle where he played at Iowa. This was the last missing piece on this offense other than maybe slot wide receiver. But man, was this ideal for them to get Tristan Wirfs. Maybe got fleeced a little bit by the Niners. I think you could have called their bluff. I don't think they were going to take him. But there you go. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. You get your guy. You get that last piece. Still an A-plus grade. Then in the second round, Antoine Winfield Jr., out of Minnesota, top 20 player in this class, in my opinion, and then fills probably the second biggest need on this team, which is safety. Whether he plays free safety or strong, you got Justin Evans, you got some young pieces there. They need that high profile safety. Antoine Winfield, my pro comp for him, is one of my favorite pro comps and something I feel more confident in most pro comps, and that is Tyron Matthew. A little undersized at five foot nine, but can line up at slot corner, free safety, strong safety, can do a little bit of everything at a very high level. I am a huge fan of this pick, a spark plug for that defense, and a young secondary that has some pieces between Jamel Dean, Sean Murphy Bunting, Carlton Davis. Uh, so if that defense can really come together here with this last piece on the back end, I think this team has not just a chance at the division, but uh, a chance to get Tom Brady yet another ring. Then we got Keyshawn Vaughn in the third round. Really not a fan of this pick at all. Now, I was much lower on Keyshawn Vaughn, even if you are higher on him. I just, you know, they've whiffed on running backs in the past. I think to me, in my opinion, this is another whiff. He does do some nice things out of the backfield. He can be that pass catching back. I think Ronald Jones with his kind of lack of understanding for the passing game and inconsistent hands would drive Tom Brady insane. So I do understand getting a higher floor pass catcher out of the backfield. Uh, so a D plus pick here. I just don't know if this had to be the pick right here. That said, you don't have a ton of needs left. So I kind of understand it. They, they really make up for it with Tyler Johnson though in the fifth round. If they just swap these two picks, it doesn't really matter. Tyler Johnson to me was a third to a fourth round prospect who can play in the slot here day one. His release off the line of scrimmage is unique. Um, he's got the shiftiness. He played really well in the slot at Minnesota. He also played on the outside. Think of like a college version of Keenan Allen is what Tyler Johnson was. So I think he's going to push for the starting slot job here and was an excellent pick in the fifth round. Then they grab some upside in the sixth round with an athletic raw 23 year old Khalil Davis. We'll see if he can develop here. I think that's the perfect kind of swing you want to take in the sixth round. I think he's got some serious upside down the road. Then they grab Chappelle Russell, uh, Chappelle Russell, sorry, an athletic linebacker out of Temple. I think it's the right kind of swing. Again, you're taking some athletes here. And then they do take another crack at running back here. Uh, again, another guy that I wasn't particularly high on. So you bring in a couple running backs here with Ronald Jones, 
I wouldn't be surprised if this team uh, went out and signed like a Devonta Freeman in free agency or something in a little interdivision, uh, interdivision revenge here. But ultimately, I give the Tampa Bay Bucks an A. I know I knocked a couple things here or there, which Bucks fans are probably going to look way too far into. I think they had an excellent draft here. And with their top two picks, they nailed it. They got great values, great players at their two biggest needs. It, it honestly wasn't that big of a deal what they did from that point on. Uh, so the hype here in Tampa Bay, I think, can be justified, especially after this draft. Now it's just wait and see to see them duke it out with the rest of this division. Uh, who, let's talk about. The Atlanta Falcons, a decent draft here. They grab AJ Terrell in the first round. He's a good player. Per, you know, 16 maybe a bit early, but he was one of the better corners in this class. He fits that scheme. He's excellent, impressed. I think he's only going to get better as a young man. Um, understanding zone coverage is going to plug right in here. Uh, so I think pretty good here at 16, getting AJ Terrell. Then I love their second round pick, Marlon Davidson out of Auburn. This is about where I had him going, but I think that's exactly what the Falcons need. I had mocked them interior defensive linemen at times in the first round. Kinlaw was well, right within their grasp, but they stayed steady. They didn't reach for a guy, uh, clearly something they wanted to do and got the good value in the second round. So I like that with Marlon Davidson. He is a great scheme fit as well because he played edge outside linebacker a lot at Auburn. The Atlanta Falcons, the Seattle cover three defense, they love big body defensive ends. Now, Marlon Davison probably going to be a full-time interior defensive lineman at three tech here right next to Grady Jarrett, but he does offer some flexibility if they choose to go that route. You know, I look at how this team used a veteran Derek Shelby in recent years as that sort of five tech, five tech on early downs. They do have Tyler Davison right next to him on the interior as well. So I wouldn't be surprised, uh, especially with them bringing in Dante Fowler here, who's not much of a run defender. If we actually saw some Marlon Davidson starting on the uh, exterior of this defense on early down, something the Falcons have done quite a bit of. So I like that pick a lot. Then they grab Matt Hennessy. It's actually a player I've mocked to the Falcons right at this spot in my what I would do mock draft. So I, I love this fit right here because he is a very high upside center but is not ready. His play strength is lacking. He's a junior coming out of Temple, had some mental mistakes. I think he's a guy that does need to sit for a year, and I can't think of a better place to sit than behind Alex Mack on a move block outside zone offense that is perfect for Matt Hennessy's skill set. Mack in the last year of his contract, I would not be surprised if we see an Alex Mack retirement after this year. This was an excellent pick. So I think they're getting some really good scheme fits, really good values in the top three rounds here. Then after that, it's it's pretty uninspiring. They grab Michael Walker, which to me is a bit of a reach in the fourth round. It was a need. They need a linebacker. They like him. I'm not going to shred it. It just doesn't get me too excited. Uh, and then they take a kind of a box safety out of California way too early for me. I am going to ding them for this one. I just think there's other positions of value you could have added here. Another receiver for Matt Ryan, a running back for if and when Todd Gurley completely falls apart. Other defensive players, corner depth, the Bryce Hall, for example. I just, this to me, I don't see him ever being much of a player here other than a special teamer. Could totally prove me wrong, but he is one of those dime a dozen box safeties that we talk so much about. And then they wait till the seventh round, they grab a punter. You know, I basically just give every special team's grade a C because A, I didn't evaluate special teams, I'm sorry. Um, don't come to this channel for punter and kicker analysis. You're just not going to get it. Um, you know, the, the thinking on this is fine. I just can't tell you anything about Sterling Hofrichter. So the final grade here, a B plus. I think the Falcons did a good job. I don't know if they walked out of this class with any like big name, like superstar future, like cornerstone pieces, which usually if you're going to get into that A range, I want to see some of those guys that can be all pro caliber players coming out of your class. I don't know if they got that. You know, AJ Terrell at 16, I think it's a good solid pick, but nothing I'm getting too excited about. So I like the draft. I think there was one pick that I really didn't like, and that was the Jalen Hawkins pick. But for the most part, a really solid draft. Then we got the Carolina Panthers, a historic draft class right here, guys. No team has ever gone seven picks in a draft or more and drafted all defense. So wow, Carolina doing exactly what myself and a lot of people had kind of said that they should do. And that is look at this offense, which has Teddy Bridgewater in there now, kind of a mishmash of offensive linemen, some guys that are guard tackle hybrids, some new pieces coming in and out, um, just kind of a mess there. Some new playmakers in and out of this offense, a new coach like 
just let it all sort it out. They've got some talent on that side of the ball, but they just have to kind of put the puzzle together there. So drafting for that would have gotten pretty complicated because you don't know what your true needs are, if that makes sense. But with a new regime to beef up on defense and restore glory here and actually give them a chance to compete right away if this defense can all click, um, picking and matching the pieces that you know you need, uh, this could be a really fun and exciting draft class here, all defense. So Derek Brown at 107. I was, I give it a C minus initially. Um, seeing everything kind of come together, I actually like this a lot more because I said it's a high floor pick. I would have looked to trade down, but you can't assume trade downs were there. Um, this is, it just reminded me of the Miami Dolphins taking Christian Wilkins in the first round last year, who's just this kind of high floor first pick of a new regime to kind of build things around. And seeing them build around Derek Brown quite literally in this draft is pretty cool because he is going to be a 10 year stud in the middle. I just don't think he's ever going to be an all pro like elite pass rusher but he is an excellent piece for that defense. Um, so I actually bumped that up, kind of seeing their game plan here. I love that. And then you grab uh, Yitor Gross Matos in the second round, which is a steal at that point. You know, I think he's a top 30 player, really great upside. The Panthers, it seems they're going to go to a 4-3 defense, and he is the excellent fit. So uh, an excellent fit. All of a sudden, I look at this defensive line. Talk about uh, putting in something in place to really build a team around. That's been the theme here. Um, but from left to right, you're going to go Yitor Gross Matos, Derek Brown, K1 Short, and Brian Burns. It was a first round last year. So this group can all grow up together with the exception of K1 Short, who's getting up there in age. And then they start building um, up behind that uh, after you draft Yitor Gross Matos, who has a long way to grow. But this team, it's a great landing spot because he doesn't need to be dominant right away. Brian Burns himself is pretty raw. So these guys are going to grow together and honestly, it might help you lose some games next year if he's kind of that raw guy that is kind of learning trial by fire, learning by error, by failure, but ultimately gets to the, to the upside that you want. That can work here. And you have a Steven Weatherly who you signed who can push him, who's a similar kind of player, just not as good of an athlete. So I like that pick a lot. Then they grab Jeremy Chin, who's going to be a linebacker, strong safety hybrid here. I, I picture him starting at strong safety. They, they brought in Justin Burris in free agency. He's just a guy. I think Jeremy Chin with that athleticism, they're going to try him at strong safety first. I, I would imagine he's going to play some dime linebacker, some slot corner stuff um, in base packages, play a little weak side linebacker. They're, they can get creative with this guy, and I think they will. Uh, and then they are able to get Troy Pride in the fourth round, which is exceptional value. He's just kind of the kind of athlete you want to gamble on. Really nice movement skills, 4 4 4 He's got the length. He's like 5'11", 6 feet tall, which will play. Um, you know, they're still kind of figuring out what kind of defense they want to run. We're still learning what kind of defense they want to run. It's a new regime. Troy Pride's going to give you some flexibility to run man coverage if you so choose because of that athleticism. Uh, I don't know how well he's going to fare as a true zone guy. We'll kind of learn that in time. But in general, I just love the value. I love the player and the fit. Then Kenny Robinson out of West Virginia. Get a little more uh, bold here. Kenny Robinson in the fifth round is excellent value. This is a guy that got kicked out of West Virginia for academics. Nothing wrong with him as a character guy. He just didn't do school very well. Went to the XFL, played in the four games that we got to see, the five games we got to see, ended up producing in the XFL. He's, he's produced everywhere he's been. He's an interception machine. He can play free safety. He can come in here and sit behind Trey Boston, who I think is going to be here for a year or two, but he's up there in age. He's not going to be around forever. I think Kenny Robinson can ultimately take over as the free safety year. So I think that's an excellent uh, value with some upside in the fifth round. Um, you know, you're not too worried about character issues once you get into this point in the, in the draft. Um, and it's, I'm not even going to say he's got character issues. Like, I, I think he'll be I think he'll be very much a professional when he gets here. He just doesn't have to deal with school anymore. Anyway, Bravey and Roy, interior defensive lineman out of Baylor. This reminds me like 10 times over of Tim Settle falling to the Washington Redskins in the fifth round of the 2018 draft. A uh, big bodied, good run stuffer, really quick feet at his size, uh, just kind of a handful. And he's a really productive run defender at Baylor. I think he's going to be a guy that can constantly be a third or fourth interior guy, just as Tim Settle's been for a good Redskins interior defensive line. That's my pro comp. And I think he's going to be able to make an impact for this team day one as that rotational player on a very thin defensive line. So an excellent pick there. And then Stanley Thomas Oliver. 
he is the kind of, I know I say this a lot, but he's the kind of athlete you want to take in the seventh round. He's lengthy, long, played at a low level of competition, has a chance. Now, he we've seen this from a lot of drafts, not just this year, but over the years, of teams taking uh, versatility of skill sets. You know, as long as you're not some teams that run a scheme where you're, you're the left corner or the right corner, and you're going to play that, you know, it's usually the Seattle cover three scheme. For the most part, most of the NFL says we're going to take a guy that's really good in man. We want some guys that are good in zone, slot corners, you know, all this different stuff. So you take Troy Pride, he's a little skinnier, quicker, faster, Stanley Thomas Oliver, longer, stronger, better in press, more instinctive in zone, longer arms to get in the, in the way of passing lanes. Uh, so a versatility and skill set. And I think they got two good players. You know, Stanley Thomas Oliver has a chance to be Garrett Bradbury here. That that is kind of his path to success. Obviously has to show tremendous work ethic to get there as a seventh round pick. So that's on him, but but that could be his ceiling there as like a good number two corner like Garrett Bradbury. So a B plus grade for the Carolina Panthers. I think you did uh, lower the ceiling of this draft by grabbing Derek Brown early. That's really my only criticism of this draft. I strongly agree with the philosophy of the draft in general and the Carolina Panthers, are slowly becoming one of my favorite teams in the league from a process standpoint. I think that David Tepper and this new regime really has a strong grasp on the direction they want to go. They know that they're probably not going to get there this year, but I just love organizations that have everything on the same page. Everyone communicates well. They have a plan and a mission. David Tepper, the businessman, coming in and doing a good job running this business. So um, I am just a fan of the direction this team is in. I would be optimistic for the future, maybe not necessarily for 2020 specifically, uh, but this is an exciting draft. There's gonna be some good football players that come out of this draft. So then we have the New Orleans Cap Wizard Saints here, and this is a weird draft class to evaluate because I look at this draft and I say, okay, Cesar Ruiz, they're planning a long-term replacement for Larry Warford, who's on the last year of his deal. Zach Bond, they're planning a long-term replacement for Demario Davis, who's on the last year of his deal. Adam Troutman, they're looking down the future, a replacement for Jared Cook. Um, and see this draft class as, okay, we've been really aggressive in free agency, we've been aggressive through trades, but let's use the draft to kind of add sustainability to this roster, which in theory, that is what they're doing. But the reason I'm confused here is the Saints have been showing in 2016, since they signed Jarius Bird with negative cap space, that this team is unbelievable as far as their ability to ma manipulate the cap. Um, they started this offseason with $2 million, uh, negative $2 million in cap space, and have since signed about nine players to a total of over $100 million. So, you know, I get it. They're like pushing cap down the road. They're redistributing bonuses. They're doing all this crazy stuff. But honestly, I don't, I'm not convinced the cap is real. I think it's this big fake Fugazi and the Saints are saying, do something about it, NFL. Yeah, we're, we're $150 million over the cap. It's fake. You're not gonna do anything. That's the way it feels here. Um, but in theory, if they are pushing these contracts down the road, they might have looked at this draft and said, oh crap, like we actually need to do something in the draft for the future. So my gut tells me that's that's the reality here, that they are eventually going to have to pay for all of this kick in the can down the road stuff. And if that's true, excellent draft here because they would literally have to cut everyone next year if that's true to clear up cap space. So anyway, they grab Cesar Ruiz, who I do think is going to be a better guard than Andrews Pete. But if that's the thinking here, he's going to be the long term replacement to Larry Warford. He will compete. I think he actually has a good chance to win that starting left guard job over Andrews Pete, who I think is is just not very good. But they did just give Pete a big contract extension. So we'll, we'll see how that all works out. Ultimately, he's a very good player. If he did take over for Andrews Pete, I think this would be the best offensive line in the NFL next season. Uh, and then they take Zach Bond. This was kind of a, a win for me. I had been saying that Twitter and, and you know football Twitter was way too high on this guy. He's not a first round pick. He's not a guy that you take in the top 50 and convert him to off ball linebacker because ultimately he is a guy like a Tyus Bowser, a Hassan Reddick, a, a Sutton Smith, who these really productive college pass rushers, but don't clear that you know six three uh, length quota, the height quota. They're under 240 pounds. 
and it's just really difficult to consistently win as a pass rusher when you don't have that length and you don't have that strength. Both of those are extremely important to rush the passer at a consistent level in the NFL. So I do think Zach Bond is a guy that needed to convert to off-ball linebacker, barring a scenario where he went to one of those hybrid defenses, a Miami, New England, all that stuff. And I said, you don't, you don't do that in the first round. All those mock drafts that had the Ravens taking Zach Bond, I, I thought that was, that was BS. You don't take Zach Bond, who's a project, uh, a really smooth athlete, but a project to, to convert to off-ball linebacker full-time. You don't take that in the top 50 picks. So here we go. He falls to the middle of the third round, and the Saints grab him. I don't see him starting day one. I think he will end up replacing Demario Davis in a year. Like I said, in theory, they should have absolutely no money at all, not even close to sign Demario Davis. And that's the role that Zach Bond's going to play with doing a little bit of everything, rushing the passer, dropping into coverage, defending the run, all that stuff. But that said, if they extended Demario Davis for a four-year $60 million contract tomorrow, I wouldn't bat an eye because the Saints have just been doing this for four years. Uh, and then same thing with Adam Troutman. They move up to get him. In theory, he should be the long-term replacement to Jared Cook, who they somehow signed as a free agent last year when they didn't have any cap space. But if you lose Cook, Troutman can be that same big body over the middle of the field, a great run after catch threat like Jared Cook, a much better blocker as well. Not quite as fast, but uh, I like the thinking here. You did have to trade up to get him. I had a third to a fourth round grade on him, so solid pick. I think in reality, you're getting three long-term answers here, a potential starter in Cesar Ruiz, a good number two tight end in Adam Troutman, and then Tommy Stevens, you know, whatever. Maybe he's the Taysom Hill of the future. Um, we'll see. Uh, but the final grade here is a B. It's not an overwhelming draft class. They only had four picks, really three picks. But with what they had, I think the thinking as well, if they're admitting that, okay, yeah, we're finally going to have some cap issues next year because we keep kicking this can down the road, let's plan for the future a little bit. I think that's really smart thinking by them. So a final grade of a B. There is your NFC South. Hit that like button, guys. A thousand likes. We will get to our final division here with the AFC South. Drop your comments down below what you think. Cheers, as always, and we'll see you for the next one. Peace out.